Did your parents ever tell you no? If you had good parents, I think uh, hopefully they did. Uh, I think if uh, I took a poll, probably everyone at some point in time was told no by their parents. It's not pleasant. We like the word yes a lot more when we're young. Um, I can remember what it was like to be six or seven. Can I have a new baseball glove? Yes. Can I have another cookie? Yes. Can I go out to play? Yes. Those were the good times, you know. The times when the word was no, the response was no, those are harder. Those are more intense sometimes emotionally, you know. And yet, there's value in learning to accept no even as a child. Back in July of 2021, we ran an article in the Tomorrow's World magazine entitled The Value of No, and it explains that topic. And in the article, uh, remember, I I wrote it, actually, Um, but uh, (laughs) I discussed one, you know, there's no way to get around that, that, you know, I, I discussed in the article... I talked about one of our dear friends in the Philippines, and her name was uh, Juliet Gonzalez, the mother of Mr. Joseph Gonzalez, who's uh, the area pastor of the Philippines today. And uh, she's now deceased, but Mrs. Gonzalez was a teacher, first grade, many, many years. And uh, after teaching for decades and watching those children grow and seeing them develop and seeing what happened to them even As the years went by, she told us one time she could predict who would be successful and who would not by their behavior, not how smart they were, not how many friends they had, not how uh, popular they were uh, or good looking, but one thing, did they understand the word no? And could they respond to the word no? That was first grade. I've never forgotten that. Very wise lady. You know, God works with us as children, and sometimes when we ask for things, he doesn't give us a yes. Sometimes he gives us a no, or maybe a a, a maybe, or sometimes a we'll see. Remember that as a kid? That's that's the one I hated. Uh, You're at the amusement park and, you you know, see an ice cream stand. Can, Can I have an ice cream? We'll see. Well, what does that mean? Uh, what are the parameters? How, what are the conditions? How will I know if we're getting to that point? We'll see, right? So sometimes we even get that from God, don't we? A we'll see. Not everything we ask for is a yes. And if we're honest with ourselves, we sometimes forget how many yeses there are. We might take them for granted. We might forget how many uh, prayers that we asked God were answered in the affirmative because the no's or let's say the not yet's stick out in our minds. They create a sharper emotional and intense reaction, don't they? With that said, let's turn over to Matthew chapter 21 and verse 22. Matthew 21 And verse 22, Jesus said, And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. Now, let's stop and think for a minute. How can this be if sometimes the answer from God is no or maybe or wait? How are we to understand this? You know, we can fall into two traps when thinking about this passage. One is, I believe in God, I believe God, and I'm going to focus on this, uh, this scripture in isolation, taken out of context, and no matter how frivolous the question or request or how unsuitable it is for me, if I don't get it, then I'm going to be discouraged and maybe even angry with God. Almost a sort of a power of persuasion, power of positive thinking, that as long as I think it and imagine it and visualize it, it's going to happen. Now, we don't put it 
in those terms, but sometimes we can get discouraged if the answer is not in the affirmative. But another ditch to fall into is, well, God didn't really mean what he said because we know he doesn't give us any, everything we ask for. He's not a genie in the bottle. And so then, since I don't want to be disappointed, I won't even ask. We can get jaded and disillusioned and not really understand the power of the God who we serve has. So what did he mean? And in particular, how can we have the right perspective when God says, not yet? If you want a title, that's my title. When God says, not yet. Since so many questions are answered by getting the right context, let's start right here in this verse and try to discern what he's talking about in Matthew 21 and verse Uh, Verse 18, backing up, it says, Now in the morning as he returned to the city, he was hungry. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves and said to it, Let no fruit grow on you ever again. And immediately the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither away so soon? This was not normal for, you know, a man standing next to them to to curse a tree, and for it to immediately die and wither on the spot. That was not normal. So they marveled. And Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, Be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. You know, stop and think about it. So the point was more focusing on God's power, on what he could do, not a frivolous question that we might come up with, but not just God's power, also the fact that he was going to give them access to that power at some point. Now, that really sets the stage a little bit more because oftentimes when we are thinking about things that we are asking for and even that we don't receive yet, that God says, not yet, or wait, or maybe, we need to broaden our perspective. We need to get a bigger picture. And essentially, that's what we're going to talk about here as we go through. There are several places in the book of John, John chapter 14, and those chapters around that area uh, that as Christ was talking to his disciples before he died, that talk about and use this terminology, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. I think it's helpful to talk a little bit about them and go through some of them and see what the context is and see how we can frame our point of reference when we're disappointed by things that we ask for and that we haven't yet received. So, what are some strategies for helping us manage when God says not yet? Number one, number one, refocus on God's work. Refocus on God's work. John chapter 14 And verse 13, John chapter 14 and verse 13, here is the the first reference to this phrase. Jesus says, And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now again, if you take that statement just in isolation, if we can take that all kinds of directions that maybe were not intended. But the point is that he was saying that um, 
If we ask in his name, he would do it. Now, there are two things here. Number one, and these are not frivolous things. You know, again, uh, if we ask for something for a million dollars or a Maserati or a, you know, give me a high paying job with no work involved. Okay. Uh, It's understood that, you know, those are not going to happen. Or uh, if we, as James talks about, you know, he says you, uh, you don't receive because you ask to consume it on your lusts. Well, we do have to think about our motivations. What are we asking when we ask of God? And is it for the right reason? Or is it trivial and, and for our own uh, desires, which may or may not be uh, appropriate? But when we look at this verse in John chapter 14 and verse 13 and 14, two things stick out. Making the requests in Christ's name. We're asking for his backing. We're asking for the one who has authority over all things, over heaven and earth, it says in Matthew 28. We're asking for his name to be attached to that request. And secondly, when we look at the context, it actually has to do with God's work, more than perhaps just a personal question. Notice in verse 12. Notice verse 12. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, The works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. Well, that's interesting. So the whole context of this statement of ask, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it, was in the context of Christ leaving and then sending his Holy Spirit so they could do a greater work than he was doing even at that time. So brethren, sometimes when we are discouraged, sometimes when we have wants or even needs that are appropriate, appropriate, sometimes it's good to take a step back and take a deep breath and ask ourselves, do we need to focus on something bigger than just this problem? Because you know, oftentimes when we have an issue, a problem, it can, it can become so big that we can't see beyond it. And the context here is there is something big that God is doing that he wants us to focus on. You know, in Haggai, it talks a little bit about um, something that was going on at that time. Let's turn over there. Haggai chapter 1. We'll come back to John 14 in a moment. But Haggai chapter 1. And verse 6. This is the story of the Jews coming back to uh, Jerusalem and rebuilding uh, Jerusalem, the, the temple, but they got started and then they got discouraged. Things went bad. And finally in Haggai chapter 1 and verse 6, God says through the prophet, you have sown much and bring in little. You eat but do not have enough. You drink but are not yet not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves but no one is warm. And he who earns wages earns wages to put into a bag with holes. Verse 9, you looked for much but indeed it came to little. When you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts? Because of my house that is in ruins. While every one of you runs to his own house. Therefore the heavens above you withhold the dew and the earth withholds its fruit. Sometimes getting our eyes on a bigger picture just helps us to manage our problems. And sometimes God may withhold even certain blessings because that's the way he can get our attention to focus on the bigger picture of what he's doing. And that is working out a plan of taking the gospel of the kingdom to the whole world. We have our needs, we have our problems, we have our frustrations, we have the things we ask for. But brethren, once in a while, isn't it good, even in that context of asking for what we need, to think about all those other people out there and their needs and what they're going through. 
and how desperately they need this message that we have. Isn't that what the work is all about? And so when we ask for things, you know, one of the strategies of wrestling with the times when we perceive that God is not answering my prayers because he's giving us a not yet, maybe we need to refocus on the work. He is working in us. He's working through us, but he's also doing a big work out there. And if we're in tune with him, we're going to be focused on that. And it's actually a strategy for helping us through those times. Number two, number two, another strategy for working through times when God says, not yet, about a request that we have. Number two, fill your mind with God's word. Fill your mind with God's word. Notice back in John chapter 15. John chapter 15, in verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. So he's talking about Christ living in us. He's talking about us living a life devoted to, to absorbing his mind more day by day. I am the vine, verse 5. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you. Notice here. Here is the second mention of this phrase. You will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Again, if we take that phrase out of context, it almost seems like, well, I can just ask for the Maserati, and I can ask for the high-paying job with no work, and I can ask for a million dollars, right? Maybe 10 million in today's dollars. Because inflation, you know, it's going up from 10 minutes ago. And yet, what's the context here about asking and you shall receive? He says, if my words abide in you, you shall ask and it shall be done for you. What does that mean? Again, when we are overwhelmed, when we're asking for deliverance from a trial, you know, maybe it's a a health trial, a number of of us are struggling from health trials right now. A number of brethren, and not just here, around, around the country, around the world. And it's not easy for them. How are we to deal with the fact that that happens and yet not get frustrated and not get impatient and not even get angry with God? When we have a, a genuine need, and it seems like it's not being answered. You know, in many situations, it's just a matter of timing. It's just a matter of timing. We read in James chapter 5, uh, Mr. Strain wrote about that in his, his uh, weekly email uh, yesterday about how important it is to pray for one another. Now, God doesn't, in one sense, need our prayers to to heal someone. And yet, let's go ahead and turn over there. James chapter 5. And yet, he, he, he wants us to pray for one another. He's moved, I think, when we pray for one another. He responds to the fact that we pray for one another. It's important to him, it's important to us, it's helpful to us, it's, it's healthy, it's good, it binds us together as, as brothers and sisters. James chapter 5 and verse, verse 14, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. 
and the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your fault, uh, trespasses to one another, and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Mr. Strain wrote this in his email. We are specifically instructed to pray for each other, noting that effectual, fervent prayer of one righteous man can accomplish a great deal. Let's be sure to pray for one another that God will intervene and heal our brethren. We are depending on one another. So God promises healing. He just doesn't promise the when, does he? He doesn't promise the timing. And sometimes it's not on the timing that we would like. Sometimes it's today. Sometimes it's tomorrow and next month, next year. Sometimes it's when we get that perfect spiritual body at the resurrection. Sometimes that's when the promise is fulfilled. You know, think about it. When God says he'll do something, it's as good as done, isn't it? It's as good as done. But it's not always immediate. Abraham was promised a son. And how many decades did it take for him to have that son? Adam and Eve were promised, if you partake of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, in that day you shall surely die. They did not die in that 24-hour period, did they? They died in a millennial day within a thousand years. God's promise was good, was rock solid. The timing we sometimes don't understand. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 36. Notice Matthew chapter 26 and verse 36. So, so God is, is working on a different timetable often than we are. And the point is that we need to search the scriptures. When we feel like we're getting a not yet, Christ says, you need to fill your mind with my word so you can understand, so you can have the right perspective so you can see what I see more and more. Notice this example of Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 36. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. So, of course, this is in the garden just before he died. This is an incredibly intense time for him. The disciples, he, he, he leaves behind in another part of the garden. He goes further, and he, he begins to be sorrowful and deeply depressed. Verse Verse 39, then he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Now, stop here just for a moment and think about this the way when we read it through, it almost seems like this prayer was about 10 seconds, you know, or, or we might think a minute or two. But it seems as if it was about an hour. About an hour of Jesus Christ agonizing over his will or the Father's will, saying, please, if possible, let me not have to go through this. But then, in the same breath, in the same thought, no, I know it's your will, I know it's the plan, I know we've got to do it, but please, if there's any other way, can you imagine for a whole hour agonizing over this? 
That's what he was going through. Then he went to the disciples. He said, what could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, a second time he went away and he prayed again and say, saying, oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. So he went back and he wrestled with God more and more and more and more. In other words, his will was fighting with God's will. He was, he was wrestling his human nature down so that he could replace God's will in his mind and get it firmly entrenched. Which is exactly what we need to do. What he's talking about. When we're struggling, when we feel like God is not intervening, we need to fill our mind with Christ's words the way he was filling his mind with the Father's thoughts and words. Just imagine this, this discourse between Christ and the Father in, the, in these prayers. This is the second time. Then it says, verse 43, And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Three times, brethren. This was an incredibly intense and difficult struggle for Christ. And yet, by the time he came out of it, he was ready. The, the thoughts and the words of his father were deeply rooted in his mind. And you read the rest of the story and you see how calm, how strong he was in that incredible trial. In fact, notice even in uh, verse 52, as the robber, as, as they came and they, they uh, 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 tried to arrest him, then uh, suddenly, verse 51, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword, struck the servant of the high priest, cut off his ear. And Jesus said to him, put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot now pray to my father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? He did not get a, a yes from the father in that situation, did he? He did not get a deliverance from the Father. And yet, he came to absolutely be committed and embrace the will of the Father and was able to go through something that is so monumental. Brethren, what about us? Have we ever struggled you know, subduing our will to replace it with the Father's will and Christ's will. I don't think any of us have struggled to the point that Christ did in this situation. But I think we can understand the, the idea because there are times when we have to wrestle with our human nature and we don't get a yes. Notice in 2 John chapter 5 and verse 14. 2 John chapter 5 and verse 14. The point is when we're doing that, we need to flood our minds with God's word because that helps us to be thinking about what God's will is. It helps us to be filling our minds with his thoughts, not our thoughts. And actually it even helps us to ask the right questions. 2 John chapter 5 and verse 14. 2 John chapter 5 and verse 14. Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. You notice that? So here John is explaining, it's not just a frivolous question. It's not just asking for $10 million. You know, it's not just asking for something out of the blue. It's, is it in God's will? And the more we flood our minds with his word, the more we understand his will, and even the questions we ask 
and the requests we make will be according to his will. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. What happens as we seek God's will? Well, it even begins to affect how we ask. You know, maybe we're praying to buy a house. Maybe that's the big decision in our life. And we can pray, God, I like this house. Please make it happen so that we could buy it. That's one way to pray. But as we seek God's mind and saturate our mind with his word, maybe it changes to, God, please direct me to the house that you know would be best for me. It's different, isn't it? That we even actually ask him to set his will in our path. Some years back, my father-in-law and mother-in-law moved to California from Arkansas. And they were house hunting and wanting to buy a house and uh, looking at houses and, and um, came up with several in a, in a row that they liked and uh, even maybe put an offer down, I believe, on several houses. All of them fell through. The, the last one, they had an offer on the house There was a crisis with the couple who owned the house. They had a divorce. Uh, Everything changed. Now the house wasn't being sold. The realtor came back to my my parents-in-law, and uh, this realtor had, had been with them through the whole process. And she said, do you pray? And they said, well, yeah. Yeah, we, we pray. And she said, um, it seems someone doesn't want you to buy a house. And they thought, yep, it seems that way, doesn't it? And they didn't buy a house, at least not at that point. Some years later, uh, it worked out. But they, they kept trying, they kept knocking, they kept looking. But over time, it became aware, they became aware that This just does not seem, it's unusual, it's strange the way they keep falling through in unusual ways, and so being sensitive to God's will, okay, maybe you want us to rent for a while, and that's what they did. Brethren, are are we sensitive to God's will? That's what Christ is talking about, I think, when he says, "If, if, if I abide in you and my words abide in you, you'll ask what you will, and you'll receive it. Our will even becomes conformed to God's will. Dr. Meredith wrote page 11 of the booklet, 12 Keys to Answer Prayer. He said, the lesson is if we truly want to do the will of the great God who created us and who gives us life and breath, we should zealously seek him with all our hearts. We should do this by urgently making time to focus on God's will by studying what he has revealed in the Bible, then meditating carefully on what the Bible says his will truly is, and fervently praying to our Father in heaven for the strength and understanding to know and to do his will. As you zealously study the Bible and yield to let Christ live in you, his will increasingly replaces your own. It affects how you pray. That last statement, it affects how you pray. Think about that. It changes the things that we even ask because we're in tune with God's will. So if if you are struggling right now in your life with a decision or a question or a request that you're not getting a positive answer from God, Maybe it's a a maybe. Maybe it's a wait. Maybe it's a not yet. Maybe it's a no, an outright no. We need to seek God's word. We need to flood our minds with God's word so we can be sensitive to his will. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, whether hearing like this or, or by listening to it when we read every day. Why do we study? Why do we read the Bible every day? Because 
we want to be sensitive to him and we want it to even affect how we make requests in our prayers. That brings us to another strategy. Number three. Number three. How, what, what can we do to manage this when we don't get yeses and we get noes or maybes or wait or not yets? Brings us to another strategy. Number three, tap into the source of lasting joy. Tap into the source of lasting joy. John chapter 16. John chapter 16. Notice Notice what, uh, what he says here in John 16 and verse 20. Uh, Jesus told his disciples, Most assuredly I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. And you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. Therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. In that day, you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. There's that statement of get. Whatever you ask in my name, he will give you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you'll receive that your joy may be full. Brethren, based on the context, what was Jesus saying? That if we ask for, you know, the latest version of an Xbox or gaming console or whatever the most recent one is, then our joy may be full? You know, or asking for a promotion or a raise or a big salary? Then our joy may be full. Nothing wrong with a promotion or a raise or a big salary. But was that what the focus was on here? It's not wrong to ask for physical things, but but I think he was talking, the context was a bigger issue, wasn't it? And that was that he was going to die and be raised and they would see him again. And that's what would give them joy. That's what would give them meaning. That's what would give them purpose. That's what would give them drive, frankly, to do the the work the rest of their lives, even, even give their lives. You know, not long ago, I talked to a, an old acquaintance, ran into an old acquaintance, not literally ran into him, you know, you understand. We talked. Uh, who used to walk with us, who used to sit with us in the church of God. Grew up in the church together, but he's out there now. He took the exit ramp along the way, somewhere along the way. And he's an atheist. We talked about his beliefs. He was very open and candid about it. Uh, He's not sure what's truth. Um doesn't consider Jesus as the Son of God who died and rose again. Those stories about the resurrection, those are just people's, you know, opinions. Somebody wrote them down. It it was really heartrending to talk to him, to talk to someone who had the hope and who had the joy that we are experiencing by being a part of God's church today and who, at least for now, walked away from it. And is just out there doing whatever he's doing. And it's really sad. Because there's no hope out there. There's no meaning out there. Especially as we see the world getting more violent and hateful all the time. Brethren, we have purpose and meaning and hope and joy because we have a resurrected Savior don't we? And Mr. Smith talked about that in a sermon not long ago. What if the resurrection is real? That powerful moment that everything hinges on. And every day 
of our lives as we capture that vision, we're one step closer to that becoming reality when we step over into that new reality of eternal life because our Savior did. And that's the context that Jesus was was talking to his disciples about asking for what you will in my name and the Father will give it. So your joy will be full. Even when there are disappointments in our lives, even when we struggle, we can weather them because we have purpose and we know why we're here. Notice in Psalm 37. Psalm 37. And verse 3. David writes, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. What are we eating, brethren? Are we eating only food? Or are we feeding on God's word, getting it in our minds, as we talked about in the last point, and feeding on the reality that every day God's faithfulness gives us meaning and purpose and life and joy? even if we go through uncomfortable things, because we know the, the point of this life is not just to escape discomfort. A lot of people, frankly, out in the world are confused about that. They think it is. But we know the point of this life is ultimately to enter into that life that is to come. And we prepare. Every day, we stay focused. We walk with him. And we get a little bit closer to that day. Verse 4, delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. You know, as we align our lives with God, it even changes the desires of our heart, doesn't it? It changes how we think. It changes what we want. It changes what our goals are. And over time, our relationship with God becomes more the goal than just asking for things. Even good things. Even good things. Our relationship with God becomes the priority. Ironically, that frees God up to bless us more in those physical things. Isn't that something? when we really put him first and delight in him, when we get our primary joy from him, not from the fleeting, you know, dopamine hits of this life, the constant barrage of of stimulating activities, that's not real joy. This is joy, knowing God and walking with him. Going on, he says, verse, verse 5, Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the new noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. We're, we're seeing a theme here. That God's promises are, are, are rock solid. When he says he'll do something, he will do it. But sometimes we have to wait for it. And even if the blessings and requests don't come right away, he says they will in time. It's interesting if you think about it, that, you know, think about the kingdom, think about the future. That'll be a time when we'll have perfect health. So all of the ailments that we struggle with will be over. New parts, can you imagine all new parts that never get old, that never wear out? No surgeries required. It's amazing when you think about the future. No material needs. I mean, think about it. What are some of the things that we struggle with in this life? Not having enough money to, to pay the bills or struggling to, 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 to get out of debt. There's going to be a time when that is not an issue. Because our Father owns everything, and we're going to inherit what he has under Christ. What about, uh, you know, troubled family problems? 
You know, that sometimes we, we have issues that may not be resolved in this life. Even though we try, even though we want to, even, even though we pray about it, even though we do our part, brethren, in the future, think about it. We're going to be with others that maybe right now we can't see eye to eye with, but God willing, they'll be there too, and we'll be there. And everybody in the kingdom is going to be on the same page. What a wonderful thing. What about if we would love to have a mate? What about if we, we want to get married, and it has, hasn't happened yet, and God hasn't provided that yet. You know, the relationships that we are going to have in the kingdom so far surpass the best marriage in this life. No comparison. What about, you know, struggling because maybe we're married, but we don't have children, and that's a trial, and that's a difficulty, and that's, that's hard. You know, as we, as we read, as we understand, when, when we're saints ruling in the kingdom, those that we work with are going to be like our children. Frankly, we, you know, the experience of working with people on that level when we're a God being, frankly, will surpass even having our own children in, in this life, if you think about it. So many things that we might struggle with right now because it's a not yet are going to be fulfilled in the future. Now, you know, maybe not every last thing. I'm sure you could think of some things that God will just say, no, that, you know, no, we're not going to do that. Uh, and that's not going to come in the future either. But most of the things will be fulfilled at that time. Luke chapter 11, notice Luke chapter 11. So really, it's just a matter of timing. And certainly we can keep asking, we can keep seeking God and, and should, and he wants us to, as we see here in Luke chapter 11, verse, verse 9. So I say to you, ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. The, the, the language is all pervasive. Because God is thinking about the future. He's not always talking about, can I have an ice cream cone right now? You know, He's thinking big. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? If he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? If he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil or, or carnal or, or human flesh know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? That's what he's driving at. That's what is the real gem, the real jewel in this life, that God is giving us an earnest of, the, of eternal life through his Holy Spirit. He promises to provide our needs, and that is the absolute greatest need ever. It doesn't mean that we can't be persistent in asking for our needs right now. Notice backing up in verse 5. He said to them, which of you shall have a friend? And go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, uh, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, do not trouble me. The door is now shut. My children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though, he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. God wants us to be persistent in asking. And Dr. Meredith explains that again in the booklet, pages 13 and 16. He says, in other words, God uses our need or desire as a vehicle to draw us closer to him spiritually. God wants us to to ask him for things so that we draw close to him. Not, not just because we want the thing. See the difference. He says to cause us to focus on his will. 
and what is really best for us and for any others who might be involved. If we carelessly ask for something and then virtually forget that we ever did, what would that indicate? It might tell God that we're not all that interested in doing what we, his doing what we ask. Or it could be that all our desires are shallow, perhaps constantly changing, and that we would not feel a deep sense of appreciation and worship even if he constantly answered such shallow prayers. It is fine within limits to pray for physical things. All of this discussion is not saying we shouldn't pray for physical things. But praying for those physical things should draw us close to God. That's the point. And if he doesn't give it to us right away, it shouldn't drive a wedge between us. We shouldn't get frustrated and even angry at God. There's a bigger picture. Dr. Meredith concludes, he says, but the ultimate purpose of prayer is to help us focus on God, yield to him, surrender our will to his as we cultivate a vital interactive relationship. In this way, he becomes increasingly real to us. A deep relationship with God. The joy. So that's a strategy as we ask for God, ask for things, ask requests, make requests to God. If we don't always get them in the time we want, we need to think about what God is really giving us and the joy that is set before us that we are waiting for. Number four, the last one. The last strategy. Number four, look for growth and fruit. Look for growth and fruit. John chapter 15. John chapter 15. This is a a wonderful time of year for growing things. The berries are coming. The vegetables are coming. the, the, uh, The plants are growing. The flowers are blooming. It's just spectacular. You know, in the same way, God is looking for growth and fruit in us. John 15 and verse 15. No longer do I call you servants. This is Christ speaking. For a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. And that your fruit should remain. That, here it is. Here's that statement. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. So the context is Christ calling his disciples and them bearing fruit. Now, we know he was specifically talking to the disciples at that moment that he had called, that he had uh, selected. But, you know, today we are the elect We are among his disciples. The Father has drawn us, and Christ is working with us. And what a privilege it is to be among that number. It's incredible. And he talks about asking and receiving from God, but not just getting things for getting things, but so that we bear fruit, so that we grow. And sometimes growth is painful. Have you ever watched a, a video time lapse of a, of a seed when it germinates and, and when it starts to grow and then pops uh, just above the level of the soil? It is sort of explosive. It's a burst of energy. It takes a lot to, to, to push through that soil. And for the same In the same way, growth sometimes is difficult for us. It's painful. Sometimes the crucibles of waiting for a blessing actually helps us grow. I can can think of times in my life and some of the most profound lessons I've learned have been, been when I've been asking for something and I've been needing something and it doesn't come right away. And I have to wait. And I have to trust and I have to think, okay, what are my motivations? And I have to think, okay, what, how do I approach this? And what am I missing? What am I supposed to be learning from this? 
And boy, those times produce deep gut checks and deep learning about what is God trying to teach me right now. And I'm convinced that there are some lessons I I just would not have learned unless he made me wait and said, not yet. I don't want to go through them again, but I wouldn't give anything for the, the things I learned from those lessons. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7. What about you? You know, sometimes when we have to wait or we're told by God, no, or not yet, that's where the growth occurs. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 7. Verse 7, this is uh, talking about Paul, how he received these visions. And then verse 7, lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, may have been a health issue, may have been an eye problem. Uh, That's what we conjecture. Uh, Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Then Paul says, therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Would you say that Paul was a weak Christian, I don't think anyone, any of us would say that. Would you say that, that God was unhappy with Paul and that's why he made him go through this? I, again, that doesn't make any sense. And yet he was able to say, you know, I take pleasure in infirmities. How can a human being say that? Unless they have absorbed God's mind and God's will on the issue. So they see, even in suffering, they see the good that it's doing. We we, we don't always know exactly why God allows us to suffer. There are times when we're not sure, and we may not know in this life. But we can rest assured that there is a reason. We can rest assured there is a reason. And we learn and we look for the lessons in the meantime. Now, I I think also this doesn't necessarily mean that we can only ask God three times for a health problem to be delivered or any other issue. Um, You know, it's, it's not wrong to continue asking God for deliverance and asking for something we need beyond three times. I don't think that that verse says we can't. But I think the point is that Paul is saying is that even as we ask, we have a settled mind about it. We're not frustrated about it. We're accepting God's will in it. As we ask, yes, for help and for guidance, and as we conform our thoughts even to him to know how to ask. 1 John chapter 3 and verse verse 16. By this we know love because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. He, he begins by talking about, look what, what, what Christ did, what he was willing to do. We saw that even having to wrestle down his human nature to do so. Even having to, to take a no for the time being from the Father who would not deliver him from that trial because there was a reason, because there was a plan. He would be given life after three days and three nights, but at that moment, he, he suffered because he loved us. 
He says, verse 18, My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. If our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. You know, if our motivations are wrong, we need to get them right. If our intentions are wrong, we need to straighten that out. And, you know, sometimes we, we, we kind of know. We, and, and we may not feel as confident. We may not feel as, uh, as close to God. We need to straighten that out. If our heart condemns us. But verse 21, if our heart does not condemn us, then we have confidence toward God. Then we have that rock solid confidence that even in trials, even in suffering, even if we don't have everything we ask for immediately when we ask for it, that God is there and is providing and will provide and will teach us along the way. And we trust him. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. Now, this has taken on new meaning for me. I think it was Mr. Weston who who first brought this out a few years ago. You know, God is not looking for people who just do the bare minimum. And that's the Ten Commandments. That's a good start. That's that's the, the baseline, right? The Ten Commandments. We absolutely must obey the Ten Commandments. But God is looking for people who are striving to get to the point where they think like God. They want what God wants. They have the perspective that God has. They have God's will that they've embraced in their life. And then it affects even what they ask in prayer. And that's what he's talking about. Brethren, God is developing his mind in us. And he he wants us to be like him. Do the things that are pleasing in his sight. And what an incredible opportunity we have to get that perspective and And sometimes it's only through allowing us to wait in trials that we're we're forced to go down that path and really ask him for help and ask him, what do you want me to do to please you more, Lord? I am yours. My life is yours. Show me. Notice Philippians chapter 4. You know, few men in the Bible suffered more than the Apostle Paul. And yet, few wrote more encouragement about being content with God's will under duress. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 11. Paul writes, he says, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Interesting statement. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, it's sort of the same language as whatever you ask, you will receive when you ask in my name. Paul was on the wavelength of God. And here he was sitting in a prison with a shackle around his foot, chained to the wall, and he said, I have learned to be content What a statement. He wasn't relishing being in that prison, but he had gotten so close to God that his words were beginning to reflect Christ's words. His thoughts were reflecting God's thoughts. That's faith and trust and spiritual maturity. 
even as he was waiting for his physical needs to be met, sitting in that Roman prison. Notice back in verse 4. Verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing. Again, he's sitting in prison. Brethren, what, what would we be thinking if we were sitting in a dark, dingy, cold, bare Roman prison? Incredible thoughts that this man put down on paper. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You know, there will come a day when the promises of God that we have been given will be totally fulfilled. In, in total, in fullness. And we will look back. Maybe we'll look back to this time. What, what time will we look back in our lives? And we may think, wow, my perspective was so limited back then. Wow, I, I, I was just, it was like I was looking through a pinhole, the, and that's all I could see at that time. And I'm so glad I persevered to trust God, to have faith, even when I didn't get immediately what I wanted. That I didn't jump ship, I didn't throw in the towel. That will be a time when it's no longer no or not yet, but yes. The answers are yes. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him amen unto the glory of God by us. Brethren, we look for that day, don't we? We look for that day when, when all of the promises are fulfilled and we are in a totally new level of existence, and it will come. For now, let's not be discouraged while in this flesh. Let's keep our eyes fixed on God and trust in Him. Focus on His work, the plan He is working out to, to give hope to the, the desperate masses of mankind. Focus on his word and filling our minds with his word so we can understand his will and his thoughts. Focus on his joy of the resurrection that, that what Christ went through and what sustained him knowing that he could see us in the future, in the kingdom. And also focusing on growing and growth and learning no matter what we go through. There's always a lesson. There's always something that God is teaching us and looking for that lesson. Let's not give up. Even when we go through trials, even when we aren't given what we want and what we need, even when God says, not yet. <laughs>